Okay, so can somebody help us, help us out with this question? Um, AE, vector AB plus vector EB. Um, the goal is to simplify this into one expression. So how can we simplify this? Sarah? Vector AB. Vector AB, yes. Can you tell us why? Great. So we're kind of cutting out that middle point and we're saying if we're starting at A and then going to E and then starting at E and going to B, the shortcut is starting at A and going to B. We can actually see that on the vector here too. If I start here and then I go here and then I add this vector on, this is actually the resultant vector, right, going from A to B. Okay. AE plus AE, how do I simplify this to one vector? Ryan, did you have a question or? Oh, okay. Lauren. Um, two AE. Two AE, very good. Devin. Why is it not AC? Uh, yeah, we could say AC as well. Uh, well, wrong direction. Yeah. We could potentially say CE uh, and then, so if, if, uh, oh no, sorry, AE and another AE, yeah, we can say AC as well, or we can say two AE, yeah, those are both acceptable. Okay, number three, someone want to help us with that? Olivia. BC. It is BC, can you tell us how you got that? Because when they're being added, those two A's in the first two get combined, and then the E of the other two get combined, and then the B's. Great, so we're cutting out all of those middle points um, and we're just left with BC. Great, okay, for this guy, what I usually do first is I flip all these guys into their positive vectors and then what did you guys get out from this? AD, AD yeah, so again, we're cutting out some of those middle points and the resultant vector should be AD. Great, any questions on those guys? Okay, all right, so um, scalar multiple, little definition for you. If you can't fit it, you can always just write above. Um, so for vector V and some scalar K, um, K times vector V is a vector of magnitude K. Um, magnitude K times as long as vector V. So we're essentially like, we're essentially saying K is some multiple. Um, and if I multiply that by vector V, we are taking that vector V and we're making it, let's say K is three, we're making it three times the length of vector V. So if we consider maybe adding vector U to itself, I would be adding another vector U on here. And I would actually write this as, we've already kind of experienced this in some of our travels so far, but I would write this as two U. So it's U that has been doubled in magnitude. Okay, and the rule is, is that if K is positive, sorry, I'm just trying to get this bottom part to load here. There we go. Um, if K is positive, then the vector will go in the same direction as vector V. If K is negative or less than zero, it will switch directions. And if k equals zero, just as, as usual, as we're used to in our, uh, all of our math, sorry, I'm just trying to get that to load, but you guys get what this is, direction as vector v. Um, and if k equals zero and I multiply that by vector v, I get a, the zero vector resulting from that. Okay, so my scalar multiple can be negative. Um, if I do something like negative three, it is still three times the length, but the direction has now been switched. Uh, Sophia, do you want to just grab the back door there? It's just a little loud. Thanks.
Are we good? Can I scroll? Okay. Okay, so here's an example. We have vector u. The magnitude of vector u, so remember those absolute value bars, those are representing magnitude. Uh, the magnitude of vector, vector u is 100 kilometers an hour at a quadrant bearing of north 40 degrees east. Um, we are going to show the vector with an appropriate scale um, in proper position, and we're going to draw 3u, 0.5u, and negative 2u. Okay, so let's first develop a scale. We need our little rulers. I'm going to do as best I can to like kind of scale these, but I don't have a ruler, so I can't but you guys can. Um, any suggestions for what we could make our scale? Maybe just we'll just talk about the first one. I think we're drawing vector u for the first one. If I need 100 kilometers per hour. Yeah, I think that's a good, um, a good scale. So one centimeter is representing here 100 kilometers per hour. Okay, so we're going to start by drawing vector u just as it is. And vector u should be one centimeter, based on our scale, in the direction north 40 degrees east. So starting at the north, going 40 degrees toward the east, and you're drawing one centimeter. So maybe something like this. And then we'll show this as 40 degrees in here, and we will label our vector as 100 kilometers per hour. Okay, so this is vector u. You can also label it vector u. Gets a little crammed in there. Okay, now let's do 3u. I'm going to use the same scale here. One centimeter is going to be equal to 100 kilometers per hour. And if I want to do 3u, I'm going to triple the magnitude of this, right? So how many centimeters should I be drawing here. We should be drawing three centimeters and that's going to represent 300 kilometers per hour because we're tripling that vector. So you should have in the same direction that needs to be three times as long. Still 40 degrees north, 40 degrees east and this here is representing 300 kilometers per hour. Okay, 0.5 u. I'm going to use the same scale for all of these guys today. So if I want 0 0.5 of vector u, we're going to make it half a centimeter. So same direction, half a centimeter. And this is going to represent 50 kilometers per hour. Okay, and then our last one is negative 2u. Same scale. Okay, so what do we do here? How does the direction change? Ryan? South, 40 degrees west. Agreed? Yes. So it's kind of like opposite angles. Like if I did, if I did 2u in this direction, my 40 degrees is here. If I want the reverse of that, like the negative 2u, it's actually just going to be the exact opposite angle over here and the same magnitude. So this guy, this guy is 2u, this guy is negative 2u. And it's south 40 degrees west. Okay, so the direction has changed. This is still representing like 200 kilometers per hour though. Um, so it would be more like 200 kilometers per hour in the direction south 40 degrees west. So we can just label it over to the side there. Okay, this that you're seeing right here in this last section here, this is an opposite angle rule where if we have an X, we know that the angles inside of those X's are actually opposite angles. So this angle and this angle are 40, and this angle and this angle are both 50, 50 and 50. So wherever that x is being formed, the opposite angles are equal. Let's throw back to grade 9 there. Any questions for this one? So far so good? Okay, collinear. 
Collinear vectors are vectors that lie on a straight line when arranged head to tail. These vectors would be scalar multiples of one another and they are also parallel. So given this definition, what's the difference between collinear and equivalent? Mark? Yes, so because collinear vectors can be scalar multiples of one another, they can't be equivalent. Equivalent vectors have to have the same magnitude as well as uh, direction. So collinear vectors have different magnitudes? They can be scalar multiples of one another, and they can also be, so because they can be scalar multiples, they could be in opposite directions. They don't have to be What do you mean? Sorry, I'm just trying to get this to load down here. There we go. Loaded. Okay. Three properties of vectors. So we learned uh, a couple of these the other day. Um, there is a distributive property. So we learn these in terms of like we learned an associative property, an identity property, and a communicative property when we're talking about like addition and subtraction of vectors. Um, this has to do with like scalar multiples of vectors. So we have the distributive property. This is the same distributive property as we know and love, uh, just with vectors. Um, so uh, scalar multiple k times vector u and vector k. Uh, oh, sorry, this is supposed to be vector v. Typo. Uh, times vector u and vector v is the same thing as the k scalar multiple of u plus the scalar multiple k of vector v. Okay. There's also the associative property that says if I'm multiplying two scalar multiples, I can do that in any kind of order, right? I can multiply the scalar multiples together and multiply that by the vector. Um, or I can take one of them and multiply it by the vector and then multiply the second scalar multiple in. So it doesn't matter the way in which I multiply in scalar multiples if they're all being multiplied together. Okay, and then the identity property for scalar multiples. Yep, the identity property for scalar multiples is uh, different than our identity property for addition and subtraction. Addition and subtraction, it's if we add the zero vector, we get back our vector. For multiplication of a scalar, if I multiply a scalar multiple of 1, of course, it, the vector remains unchanged. I just get back that original vector. So same math rules as we always have used. Is that a 1? Yep, 1. Yep. Yep. So. Distributive property is just saying I can, if I have two vectors being multiplied by a scalar, I can bring the scalar in and multiply each individual vector by the scalar. Associative property is just saying if I have like two scalar multiples, I can multiply them by my one vector in any order. It doesn't matter the order in which I do that. Are we good? Can I scroll? Yes. Sarah, do you need a second? Yeah. The associative yep. uh, property. It's just like you get like multiplied like sorry, we asked you. Okay, so the associative property, A and B are scalars, so they're part of the set of real numbers. U is a vector, and it's essentially just saying I can multiply two scalars to a vector in any order. I can multiply the scalars together and then multiply them by the vector or I can multiply the vector by one of the scalars first and then multiply in the second scalar after and it remains the same. And then multiplying by y. Just gives us back the vector, yeah. Just as it does with any regular number. Okay, are we good? Can I scroll to the next part? Okay. I don't know why this, these are not loading properly. <laughs> On it? Yeah. Good idea. Okay, we're learning a lot of kind of new lingo today. So the next one is linear combination. So 
a linear combination. A linear combination is created when we're adding two vectors uh, with scalars. Um, so here's an example for you guys. So we have a trapezoid, and the trapezoid is called ABCD. And a trapezoid, basically the definition of a trapezoid is that we have two sides parallel, two sides not. So the two sides that are parallel here, it's telling us that BC is parallel with AD. And also that uh, AD is actually equal to 3 times BC, so the scalar multiple. So if I took BC and I multiplied it by 3, I would be getting the length of AD. Um, okay, so we are letting AB be vector u, so just simplifying that into like one, a one letter expression for our vector, and BC is going to be vector v. And our job here is to express AD and BD and also CD as linear combinations of u and v, so scalar multiples, combinations of scalar multiples of these vectors. Okay, so AD. Um, the direction of AD is going from A toward D. Uh, we do know that BC is equal to vector V, and we do know that there is a, these should have vector symbols. Um, we do know that, I guess they don't necessarily need vector symbols. Um, yeah, I guess we don't necessarily need those. It's just saying the length of side. Yep. Uh, I mean, we're just learning like the very basics of how we express vectors. So think of this as like your foundation of like, uh, like how multiplication kind of helps us with greater things. So we're going to talk about like different things with like forces and stuff like that. So this is all just like laying all the foundational stuff. Okay. Sorry, guys. Let's rein it back in here. Okay. So if I know BC is vector V, and I know that side AD is equal to 3 times the length of BC. Can someone express for me AD in terms of U and V? Yes, 3V. Okay, and I'm getting that from this expression up here. Okay, so AD is done. BD. Okay, BD, the vector BD, goes here. And now that we know this, I would like to label that as 3V. Thoughts on how we can express this as a linear combination of U and V? Olivia. Can you do like BD plus BA and then AB would be U? BD plus... DA. Okay, so, but we're expressing BD in terms of other vectors, right? So BD has to be equal to something. We can't be adding it to something. Uh, Devin. So like you, you can't say AB equals, uh, AB plus 3D? So the only thing is, is that uh, AB goes in this direction and AD goes in this direction. So these vectors right now, AB and AD are arranged tail to tail. And this is the resultant when they're arranged tail to tail. So what does that give us? Is this an addition of two vectors? Subtraction. Okay, it's arranged tail to tail. And when I put that resultant there, that's actually subtraction of two vectors. Mark? It's 3V plus U. Not quite. 3V minus U. Yes, okay, it is 3V minus U. So I'm gonna unpack that for you in a second here. So when I arrange vectors tail to tail and I have the resultant vector kind of connected to those two things, so looking at how we have these arranged right now, just stripping everything else away, we have AB and AD, they're arranged tail to tail. Now, if this is U and this is 3V, I have two ways of knowing, well, I have a way of knowing which one is being subtracted from which one. Either it's U minus 3V or it's 3V minus U. It depends on the direction that this vector is facing. If it's facing toward U here, then it's U minus 3V. If the tip is pointing toward 3V, 
it's 3v minus u. Okay, so wherever, if I have a vectors arranged tail to tail and I have that resultant vector kind of between them, wherever the vector is pointing, that's the vector that you start the subtraction with. Okay, Olivia? How do you know AD is going that direction? Um, well, we kind of like we're, because BC is going in this direction and we let this be 3V, we're saying it's going in the same direction as BC. Okay? Okay. Sarah? So because like the arrow on the bottom of the point is toward B, or like, um, yeah, toward B. Yep. That means that it's like 3V minus U. Yep. Otherwise it would be, like let's say it was like that arrow was at U, oh, sorry, it was at B. Yep. Then it would be 3V, sorry, U minus 3V. You got it. Yep. So we just look for where it's pointing toward. Very good. Okay, last one. We have CD. So that's this guy right here. So we could actually just, let's just label this guy. This is 3V minus U. And I'm looking for this now. And this is CD in this direction. Hmm. Yep. Yes, can you tell us, unpack how you got that for us? Yes. So, can you explain to your classmates what your thinking is here? Uh, so we have two, like, tail to tail, and the one that's pointing in the same direction is B, and then we have to subtract the other one. Did everybody hear that? Okay, one more time, Mark, louder. So you have uh, tail to tail over here, so you have Good. Okay, so the tail to tail is right here. Okay. So we are saying that, oh, sorry, I put, that's my fault. I put this going in the wrong direction. Uh, the tail to tail is right here. Oh. Okay, and CD is pointing toward this vector right here. So this must be the one we start with, and this must be the one we're subtracting. So we're taking this whole vector, and we're subtracting this guy. Okay, so this is what we were just discussing in how we decide which one is being subtracted from the other one. So wherever this vector right here is pointing toward, which is our vector 3V minus U, I'm taking that one and I'm subtracting the other vector. Okay, so here, when I combine 3V and I subtract vector V, I get 2V minus U. Good. Okay, are we all okay with that one? Okay, same kind of idea as what we just did with BD, except for the expression for the first vector is just a little bit longer here. Okay, angles between vectors. When we are describing the angle between vectors, we actually always use the angle that they form tail to tail, um, which is why we need that tail to tail uh, setup sometimes. So if we are saying that the angle between vector V and vector U is 120, um, I am essentially creating two vectors here that, um, that should form, when I put them tail to tail, they should form an angle of 120, okay? So let's just say, we don't know the magnitudes of these things, it doesn't give us vector V and vector U, but we're gonna make a vector V and a vector U, and I'm gonna just show you that 120 angle. So let's just suppose that this is our vector V and vector U. If I say that the angle between them is 120, that's the angle when they're arranged tail to tail. Now, if I'm adding these vectors, I usually don't like to use that tail to tail method, but we can use our parallelogram method 
and just kind of create that parallelogram within there so that I can find the angle of them being arranged head to tail. So if this is 120, there is a special rule that we learned about in grade nine. It's the C rule. What does the C rule tell us? They equal 180, that's right. So when I make this parallelogram, these two interior angles actually add to 180. So I know that this guy, and that's only when we have like parallel lines here and here. Um, I know that this guy is 60 degrees. So that's actually the angle um, that I could use to kind of show when they're arranged tip to tail. Okay, so I know that this is 60 in here and these guys are 120. So so we know that these angles add 180. This only works when you have the parallel lines. So because I have this on both sides, I know that these two angles inside of these two parallel lines are 120 and 160, and these two are also parallel lines, so I know that those add to 180 as well. So both sides have parallel lines. So I'm just showing you guys that if you arrange these two vectors, tip to tail method. So if I did vector V plus vector U, I actually now know what the angle is in between here. So if they're arranged um, tail to tail and it's 120, I know that when they're arranged tip to tail, the angle will be 60. Okay, so it just helps us when we're like setting things up. Okay, cool. So we have the magnitude of vector M being five meters and the magnitude of vector N being 10 meters. We know vector M and vector N meet at an angle of 70 degrees. Find the magnitude of vector M plus vector N. So I want the magnitude of the resultant when I add these vectors, okay? Um, so vector n is 10 times, or double the length of vector m. And I know that the angle between them is 70, so you guys can, if you have a protractor, you can make that um, angle as close as you can. If not, we're kind of estimating. Devin? Um, so how do you know like, which way to draw the arrows? Uh, the answer is we don't, really. Um, we just know that when we set them up, this angle has to be 70 between them. But I don't really know the exact rotation of those things. I usually just try to put one on the horizontal. That way, like, I can kind of estimate my angle a little bit easier. When it's, like, kind of random, it's maybe harder for me to see where that 70 degree angle is. Like, I started with M like, before you did it. Yep, that's okay. Yep. That's right. Um, when we're describing the angle between the vectors, but here it's just like they just meet at an angle. Yep. Um, so anytime you see that, it's tail to tail. Anytime, anytime, we see anytime it gives you an angle between vectors, it's telling you tail to tail when they're arranged tail to tail. Okay. So here's what I want. I want to set up the parallelogram here. That was maybe not the best line. And here's my other vector n. So here is the vector m and the vector n arranged tip to tail. What is this angle inside here? 110. Good. And my resultant vector, my resultant vector goes starting here at the tip or the tail of m to the tip of n. That's my resultant. This is uh, m plus n in here. Olivia? What happened if, like, when I was doing it in my head, I found 110, like, as the ang other angle? Does that matter or not? As this right here? Yeah. Yep, so you're just doing N plus M. That works, too. Yep. Still, the resultant will be the same. It will be this line in the middle, right? Yeah. 
Doesn't matter which side of this we use, right guys? Okay, so vector n, I know the magnitude of this guy is 10 meters, and I know the magnitude of this vector m is 5 meters. Can I find the magnitude of this here using some trig? Okay, so if you want, you can separate out the triangle that you have here. The triangle you have says this is 10, this is 5, and this angle, this included angle right here, is 110. This is our question mark. We can find that, right? What do we need to find that? Cosine law. When we have two sides and a contained angle between them, I use cosine law. So um, if you want, you can create a variable for this. You can let it be some kind of variable, or you can just maintain that magnitude of m plus n if you'd like. Uh, when I sub this into cosine law, it's going to be the magnitude of m plus n squared. Um, and that's going to be equal to the magnitude of n squared plus the magnitude of m squared minus 2 magnitude of m times magnitude of n and the cosine of the contained angle. Okay, so when I calculate this, I'm going to want to square root both sides to get rid of that square root there. Or square, sorry, to get rid of the squared. I got the same thing. You guys got all get that? Yeah. I actually got four. Six, six, six one, seven, five, two. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll round it. Okay. Every <laughs> time. Um, guys, can I ask you, what do we do when we need direction of this? This one just asks us for magnitude, but suppose we were asked for some kind of direction. Yeah, Olivia? Just start with like a phase direction of like where the other two are. Yeah, so a lot of times what we do is we measure off of a vector. So I could find the angle in here or the angle in here, and I can say that my resultant is at an angle of this many degrees. It's going to be obviously less than 70 off of vector m or off of vector n. Um, and that would really be, be because we don't know exactly where m and n are placed in space. It's any kind of rotation. We measure off of one of those angles. So I would maybe find this little angle in here using, let's say we use sine law. Um, and then we're going to say it's this many degrees off of vector m. Um, or if you let n be on the horizontal, maybe you can say, well, yeah, maybe we won't say off the horizontal. But we'll say off of vector m or off of vector n. Um, shall we do it? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to find this, vec this angle in here. We're going to use sine law for this. So I'm going to say sine of theta is going to be equal to its opposite side. Yep. And then I'm going to use this pairing right here. So we just found the, the magnitude of mn. And we know the sine of its opposite angle. Ryan? Mm -hmm. I'm just, nope, we don't. Okay, so let's do this calculation right here, and then we're going to take the sine inverse of that in our calculator. And if you want to leave this in its exact value, you can do that too if you want to be even more accurate with your answer. Finding this dark one right here. But don't we know it's 70? Nope, this whole thing is 70. Oh, gotcha. Okay, sine inverse. 48.125. So, Basically, I can't say anything other than the fact that this is 48.125 off of vector m. So therefore, if I were trying to find the direction, mn, m plus n is, we'll say, 48.1 degrees off vector m. Okay? 
or we can say m plus n makes an angle of 48 degrees with vector m. Okay, in this case, we didn't have to do this. We did it anyways, just for fun. Uh, but this one was just asking us for the magnitude of m plus n, the resultant. Any questions for this one? Okay, and again, this is the angle that I was just finding right here, theta inside there. Good? 